When launched in Japan at the end of 1990, the Super Famicom or Super NES as it's known outside of Japan is a 16-bit system developed by Nintendo as the successor to the popular NES. The Super NES became a global success worldwide, but it also had fierce competition from Sega and their 16-bit Genesis console. The Super NES would feature some interesting hardware choices. Its main CPU would be the Rico 5A22, based on the 16-bit 65C816, and it ran at a very moderate 3.58 MHz. For a 16-bit console, this seemed to be woefully underpowered, especially when we compared it to the Sega Genesis that ran a Motorola 68000 at more than double the clock speed. But it would be the Super NES's advanced graphical capabilities and the options to the developer that really would make the console so unique and interesting. And in the end, the Super NES was the best-selling 16-bit console of all time. And in this episode, we are going to take a look at the unique underlying graphical architecture of the Super NES. To best explain how the graphics on the Super NES worked, it's worth taking a quick moment to look at the NES. The NES, or the Nintendo Entertainment System, was a very capable 2D system, thanks to its PPU, or Picture Processing Unit chip. This chip would be the base for what would be used and advanced upon in future 2D-based Nintendo hardware. And as a quick primer on the NES, everything is drawn using tiles, or 8x8 pixels. There is one background layer and one sprite layer, and each tile is two bits or four colors. For the Super NES then, Nintendo would offer a significant improvement by offering two unique PPUs inside the console, and these were known simply as PPU1 and PPU2. These are both easily identifiable on the SNES motherboard. The later one-chip SNES would consolidate the CPU, PPU1 and PPU2 into a single chip. But what is the purpose of two PPUs? Well, Nintendo knew that the CPU alone would struggle to perform many graphical effects that were wanted on the system. They were becoming quite common in the 16-bit landscape, as well as in the arcades. Features such as transparency, fading, mosaic effects, scaling, and rotation. The dual PPU approach of the SNES takes all these tasks and distributes them across both. PPU1 handles graphics, tiles and sprites, but it also handles a unique feature that could rotate, scale and apply transformations to them. We said earlier that the NES uses tiles of 8x8 pixels. The Super NES doubles that limitation, offering either 8x8 or 16x16. Tiles themselves are compressed in memory to save on cart space. On the NES, tiles had a 4 color limitation. On the Super NES, the minimum allowed is 4 colors, or 2 bits per pixel up to a maximum of 8 bits per pixel, or 256 colors. The NES has one background layer, while the Super NES allows for up to four. Each layer is tile-based and can have a maximum of 32 by 32 tiles in height and width, which is the equivalent of 1024 by 1024 pixels. These layers can be flipped either vertically or horizontally and can be scrollable in both the X and Y axis. Smooth scrolling is one of the most important features when it comes to 2D gaming, and specific registers on the SNES are available for the developer to control scrolling. Take for example Super Mario World. If we run the game, you can see that the shaded area in grey is our viewport, which mentioned is composed of 32 by 32 tiles. When we move Mario to the left or the right, the X scroll register is adjusted to simulate movement, but note that the overarching tile map is fixed until Mario reaches a certain point to the left or the right of the screen, and the game needs to know that it must load in new tiles into the map to bring in new areas of the world into the viewport. And this is a pretty common approach when it comes to 2D gaming of the era. Now when it comes to the Super NES hardware, as a radical departure from the NES, the Super NES had seven different graphics modes that the developer could choose from to make their games. There is actually an eighth mode, but we'll talk about that later because it really deserves its own piece. But let's talk about the first seven modes, and that is modes zero through six. Mode zero is known as the NES mode. It's limited to four colors, just like the NES, but it can use all four layers. Mode one uses three layers, two of which are 16 colors, and the third is four colors. Mode 1 was sort of the de facto standard when it came to Super NES games of the time. If we take a look at Super Metroid, background layer 1 is the immediate layer, while background 2 is the further away background tiles, and then background 3 is the heads-up display. 
Outside of Mode 7, which we'll get to shortly, Mode 1 was the most commonly used mode for many games. Mode 2 then offers two layers with 16 colors each. Now you're probably wondering, why would you select Mode 2 instead of Mode 1? Because you're only using two layers in Mode 2. Well, the trade-off here is that both Mode 2 layers can scroll individually. Mode 3 offers two layers, one with 128 colors and the second with 16 colors. This mode would be the preferred option when it came to games that use the Super FX chip. Mode 4 offers two layers, one with 128 colors and the second with four colors. Mode 5 supports two layers, one with 16 colors and one with four colors. But this is a unique mode that offers a double vertical resolution of 512 pixels. And Mode 6 offers one layer in 32 colors. It's fair to say that modes 4, 5, and 6 were certainly edge cases, but they did have their purposes and uses depending on the scenario. For example, mode 5 was used in games such as RPM Racing and the menu screens in Secret of Mana. It should also be mentioned that modes could be adjusted during the game. For example, on a title screen, you could be running on mode 5, and then during the game itself, switch over to mode 2. So that covers us for modes 0 through 6, but mode 7 is the most famous mode of all the modes, and we're going to talk about what mode 7 is and how it works on the Super NES. Mode 7 is a single background that can have up to 256 colors but it has a unique feature of being able to apply the following fine transformations completely in hardware. These are translation, scaling, rotation, reflections, and shearing. The SNES PPU could be fed these values to adjust the background in what appears to be a mode that is some sort of fake 3D. In the right hands, Mode 7 was quite impressive. If we take a look at the most famous Mode 7 game, Super Mario Kart, you can clearly see the use of one background mode, the track itself. The only other thing that's layered on top of this mode are the sprites, which we will get into. And while we are here, let's take a look at how simple and clean these original Mario Kart tracks were defined. It almost looks like a high school project of sorts, but by applying the appropriate Mode 7 transformation, the tracks become instantly familiar. And you'll note that the same rules apply that we said previously, in that Background Mode 1 can still scroll X and Y, and as we race around the track, you'll see that the 32 by 32 tile viewport adjusts itself given the position of the player on the track. Let's take another example, Super Metroid. The intro is entirely Mode 7, and the giveaway is when scaling is applied to the intro. Note that the Super Metroid logo are actually sprites in this example, and not traditional background tiles. And this does bring up an interesting point, that these Mode 7 transformations can only be applied to that background layer, and not to individual sprites or the sprite layer itself. And this is why the SNES was not capable of true 3D, because it lacked the computational power of the main CPU. However, the Super FX chip would be introduced that would offer 3D games on the SNES, with the most popular being Star Fox. Mode 7 was such a success for the SNES that it was used as a marketing tool and a critical feature that the competition lacked. The phrase Mode 7 style games became quite popular. The Genesis and the Amiga had no answer to the SNES's Mode 7, but in the right hands, developers could do Mode 7 style tricks. But the takeaway here is, during the days of the 16-bit console wars, everyone wanted to do Mode 7, but only the SNES offered it out of the box. Sprites on the Super NES are also enhanced from the NES. There is a single sprite layer that can display up to 32 sprites per scan line. They can select from 9 different color palettes and be flipped by X and Y registers. But this is certainly not the end of the discussion. One thing that the Super NES was really good at was transparency effects. Note that I said effect because there's no true transparency on the Super NES. The way it's handled is quite simple. It can take two colors and either add them together, average them out, subtract them, or subtract them and then halve them. Transparency is a really complicated topic on the SNES, and it's one area that took years to understand and implement in emulation effectively. But the result is some stunning looking 2D effects that the PPU can handle with ease. There are many different ways that the hardware can apply transparencies, but let's take a look at a simple example. In this scene in Secret of Mana, we are running in Mode 2. Background 1 shows us the rock formation around the waterfall, but note there is no water displayed. However, background 2 does show the water and the waterfalls. By simply taking the average of two colors, you can see that the effect of the translucent water and waterfalls really start to show. 
Last, but certainly not least, is HDMA, or H-Blank Direct Memory Access. This is a unique and important hardware feature that allowed for the manipulation of many PPU registers while the screen was being rendered to apply unique and interesting effects. An example of this would be gradient style backgrounds. HDMA has eight individual channels that can set PPU registers. And when combined with mode seven, it can really show off some amazing 2D effects in games. So in conclusion, Nintendo really did make the right choice when it came to the Super NES. They offered a pretty weak CPU, but they really specced up the 2D tile drawing side and then complemented it with not only many different screen modes or many different modes that developers could pick from in order to get their work done and by offering mode 7, which was the main differentiator between the Super NES and its competition, it really did mean that the Super NES was uniquely powerful enough and interesting enough that developers could get some fantastic results from. And mode seven is still a term that we use today. And that is something that is quite interesting to think about given the fact that the Super NES is quite old these days. There are many people that probably weren't even born when the Super NES was around, but the phrase mode seven is still kind of thrown around and many people just know what that means. And I think that really is a credit to the hardware and Nintendo's vision for what they wanted for the Super NES. But that will do it for this episode, guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, don't forget to leave me a thumbs up and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.